Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ in Portland on this first Sunday in May, the fourth Sunday in Easter. If you are joining us for the first time, we are delighted you have found us. In the United Church of Christ, we like to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today we are in for a special treat. We are welcoming the Reverend Rob Tullock to our pulpit. This is for something in our United Church of Christ denomination called a neutral pulpit. That means that uh, Reverend Rob is in a search for uh, a settled ministry in a new congregation and a congregation has invited him to uh, give a sermon and lead uh, worship in a church other than their own church and other than his church. Therefore, it is a neutral pulpit. It's uh, an essential part of the search process in the United Church of Christ. And we are delighted to be providing this service to our conference uh, today and to Rob and this other church in our conference. For purposes of confidentiality, uh, we do not disclose the name of the other congregation. And we ask that you would protect the confidentiality of this process by not sharing uh, details uh, about uh, Rob uh, or his uh, presence with us today uh, beyond uh, those who are with us uh, on the service today. So uh, we are just so happy that Rob is going to be able to be with us and we're really looking forward to hearing his message this morning. At First Congregational United Church of Christ, we always begin our services by ringing a meditation bell, which allows us to pause and become aware of the presence of God in us and around us and in our midst. And so as I ring this bell, I invite you to center your hearts and minds in God and prepare yourselves for worship this morning.
Amen. Now I'd like to invite you to join with me in our responsive call to worship. I will be reading the leader uh, line, the one line, and uh, Reverend Rob will be reading the all line for us as you are invited to participate by reading the all line uh, at home. Uh, that uh, call to worship is now posted in our chat box and on our Facebook live comments. So please join me now as we call ourselves to worship. No matter who we are or where we are from, we are all children of God, sacred, holy, and worthy. No matter what we have gone through or done in our past, we are all children of God, sacred, holy, and worthy. Everything we have to offer the world is important because we are children of God, sacred, holy, and worthy. We are entrusted to bring the good news to all because we are children of God, sacred, holy, and worthy. Now I invite you to join with us in singing our opening hymn, Be Now My Vision, which will be uh, on your screen in video format with the words. That was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's a real treat to have such a gifted music ministry leading us into worship uh, as we join together today. Uh, please, uh, if you have a Bible available and you can open to 1 John 3, 1 through 3, we're going to be reading our scripture for today. Uh, I believe you guys have it listed as an ancient testimony, which I think is a beautiful thing uh, to bring in the testimony of people. Uh, because that's who wrote the Bible, right? People wrote the Bible. So we read here 1 John 3, 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed, 
what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as Jesus is pure. Now, Reverend Rob is going to be leading our children's time this morning. And I just wanted to say a couple more words for those of you who are, especially the younger ones in the congregation. Uh, Reverend Rob uh, has last been a pastor in Wichita, Kansas for the Hillside uh, Christian Church. He graduated from Claremont School of Theology and he's been in full-time ministry since 2013. He has a lovely wife, three dogs and two cats. And he loves hiking, music, and video games. So I'd love to ask him which video games he likes, but I won't do that right now. So what I would like to do is ask the children who are present, raise your hands and I will unmute you. All right, so we've got Julius. I see you too. And let's see, do we have... Thomas there. Oh, we have, we have Logan. Hi, Logan. Great. And then let's see, do we have keeping going, going through who else? Does anybody see Thomas yet? Okay. They were going to try to join, but looks like they are not. Oh, Karen, you want to join us? You bet. All right. All right. We'll have Karen join us too. Sometimes we invite children in heart to join as well. Fantastic. Thomas yeah. is there. Margaret is there. Why am I? Somebody unmute Thomas. If you see him. Uh, Andre. I don't know why I can't see Thomas. Hmm. Hello. Andre, have you unmuted Thomas? Here I am. Okay, great. Oh, there he is. Okay, great. All right, <laughs> Reverend Rob, take it away. There we go. All right. So it's so fun to see uh, kids smiling on here because often it's it's you know a bunch of adult faces and and we don't smile as much. I don't know why, uh, but it is so good to see all your little smiles. So I want you guys to look real close and tell me what that is. A dollar. It's a dollar. That's exactly right. So it's a dollar. And how many of you guys get an allowance by a show of hands? You, you do some chores around the house. You get a couple bucks here and there. Yeah, a few dollars. <laughs> okay. So when I was your age, I, I got a couple dollars a week and I was so excited to take my dollar to the dollar store. And I know that that sounds kind of goofy, but I was so excited to get the $1 plastic dinosaur when I was a kid <laughs> or the $1 like pack of, they were called Z-Bots, which I doubt anybody younger than me will know. But those things were so much fun. And it was because this was worth something to me, right? Because I got something out of it. Now, some of you who maybe don't do chores just yet might have gotten money from the, the tooth fairy or maybe your grandparents or parents have given you a gift once or twice. Uh, but the, this, this money means something. And it means something because maybe it's yours. You earned it and you're excited that you get to use it however you want. But this dollar is pretty crisp and clean, right? It, there's nothing wrong with it. There's no tears. There's no frays. And, but it's worth a dollar. Okay. Now pay attention. Okay. I hate doing this to money. It makes my heart hurt. I'm Scottish. Yeah. All right. It's a lot less pretty now, but about how much is it worth? One dollar. One dollar. That's, that's correct. If I were to crumple it up again and throw it against this wall right here. Uh, uh, okay. All right. How much is it worth now? One dollar. One dollar. Very good. If I put it on the ground. Okay. One dollar. Oh, you're picking it up. You're good. You're, you're okay. One dollar. It's One dollar. One dollar. Okay, I'm gonna do something, and nobody report me to the Federal Reserve. Oh. Uh, how much is this worth? One dollar. One With a little bit of tape. It's worth a dollar, right? <clears throat> so if I do anything to this dollar, as long as it's still kind of put together, it doesn't matter because it still has value and it still has worth, right? 
I want to talk to you guys about you as children of God. You have that same work. It doesn't matter if you get crumpled up. It doesn't matter if you mess up. Nothing you can do can value or lower your value in God's eyes. We never lose our value, no matter even if you make mistakes, if you're grumpy to your siblings on the live stream, none of those things lower how much God loves you. Amen. Amen. And it was good to see Soren too. Good to see all of you, young and old. We are going to sing our uh, song with the children. Halle, halle, hallelujah. Alle, 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 Luja, alle, 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 Luja, alle, 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 Luja, Alleluja, Alleluja. Now I invite Rob to give us, oh, it's my turn to give the modern testimony, getting ahead of myself. Our modern testimony comes from Mike Slaughter, who's a Methodist minister and author. An encounter with the resurrected Jesus does not just transform the way we view ourselves, it causes us to see others in a new light. The poor are no longer lazy, ignorant, or simply unlucky. They are the people God loves. So much so that more than 2,000 scriptures are dedicated to justice for the vulnerable and poor, the widow and orphan. God teaches us to love ourselves and love others as ourselves. The resurrected Jesus reveals that it truly is more blessed to give than to receive, and that ultimately the measure of our lives will be based on whatever we do for the least and the lost. Jesus even redefines enemy, not as someone to hate, but as someone worth praying for, an individual of sacred worth and God potential. Amen. Is it my turn now? Okay. <laughs> so today's scripture is one of my favorites. I think that it is part and parcel to not only how we should view others, how God sees us, but how we should really try to determine our own worth. And I've always wondered what determines something's worth. When it comes to collectibles, there are many things that contribute to an item's worth. Who made it, how much they made of it, uh, maybe even who owned it before you will factor into the overall cost of whatever is being collected. When I was a kid, I watched a TV show called Antiques Roadshow. I don't know if any of you remember that. It's, I think it's still on TV. I probably claimed that I didn't like it as a kid. I probably claimed that I was bored, but I definitely found the people and the items interesting. One of the episodes that I remember the clearest was capstoned by a Native American rug. A simple, humble little man brought in a Navajo rug to the show. He didn't think much of it. He was as excited as the appraiser was, as the appraiser started to talk about it. But this blanket was simple. It was linear. It just had a few lines of cream color, some faded black, and some very soft purple. This blanket was just sitting on the back of this man's chair, but it was, as he found out, the first type of chief's blanket made for Ute chiefs by the Navajo. He described it as Navajo weaving in its purest form, with the indigo dyes and a wool so fine that it felt like silk. This rug was given to this man's grandmother by Kit Carson, who some of our saints may remember as a frontier legend. This blanket at the time was worth about $350,000 to $500,000 when this sweet old gentleman brought it to the show. 
It recently sold at auction for $1.8 million. This blanket was described as a national treasure. And I remember it however many years later, I remember that blanket because honestly, it was worth a lot. But what gave it its worth? Who made it? Who it belonged to? So many factors go into giving something its worth. But in the end, something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So what are you worth? What are the people next to you at home worth? What are your coworkers worth? What are your friends worth? What are your frenemies worth? What are the people who made fun of you in high school worth? What are people in jail worth? What are people in today's day and age with non-essential jobs worth? It's hard to assign value and worth to people, but our scripture today is quite explicit. We are all children of God, loved and lavished upon like Christ, pure, wanted, claimed. Our value, our validity, our voice are all centered on the fact that we are children of God. How lucky we are well, maybe not lucky. I don't necessarily like the word lucky. It takes away the intentionality of our creation, of our being chosen, of our being wanted, of our being cherished by God. So how about how serendipitous that we are called children of God? This value is inherent to who we are as children of God. We hold a special place in creation, not only because we are made in the image of the divine, but because we have been given authority over God's creation. This authority may not be something that we live up to all that often, especially in the post-industrial age, but we are God-made, and all the things around us are God-made, and God loved us enough to put us in charge of all of it. But as we engage in the 21st century, I'm sure I'm not the only one that sees that we are divided, that we do not honor the love and care that has gone into making all that surrounds us and all that are make up each and every one of us. I fear that as we move forward in our world today that we justify dehumanizing the other, that we deny the fact that all people are children of God and thus have value. I have seen this both in the people that I disagree with strongly, as well as the people who support my way of thinking. The ones I would consider friends in this race that we are all running, still denying the other when they get a chance. But the reality is that Jesus never did this. There was never the other where Jesus was concerned. Jesus even re redefines enemy not as someone to hate, but as someone worth praying for as Mike Slaughter reminds us. Not only does Jesus knock down the notion that we are people, that there are people that are enemies, there, there's no such thing that's an enemy to Jesus. He encourages us to take steps to be for those people. The pastor friend of mine once told me the foundation that he builds marital counseling upon. He says that he invites the couple in and before any conflict is discussed, he invites them to pray for one another, giving them a minute to collect their thoughts. He makes sure that all parties are there for a shared reason, for the health of the relationship. So when there's strife between spouses, the whole foundation for its remedy is prayer, where we vacate the space of us versus them and enter into a space of we versus the problem. This has settled in my heart ever since then. Whenever there is a broken relationship in my life, it's not them versus me, it's we versus our conflict. So I invite you to think of the people in your life that you might have a fractured relationship with, no matter what that relationship might be, professional, personal, intimate, or just an acquaintance. Maybe even those people that you have never actually met, but you have somehow strongly formed a negative opinion of them. And I want you to take a moment and pray for them. I'll give you a moment to collect your thoughts as you allow yourself and God to address the fact that those people are God's children. Pray for their shalom 
for just a moment. They are loved. They have journeyed. They've never lived life in a vacuum. And they have value to God. I mentioned this word vacuum. None of us lives our life in isolation. Each of us has gone through a lifetime worth of experiences. We have come to conclusions and opinions and firmly held beliefs because of what we have gone through. And I think it's important to validate those things from time to time. We negate the position held by the other, even though they've experienced something along the way that has helped them form that opinion. We cannot take that away from them, much because we don't want them to take it away from us. I have a colleague in ministry that I disagree with a lot on stuff. He's a pastor. He does good ministry. He loves his congregation dearly, and he brings them a heartfelt message every Sunday. But we have differing views on theology, social norms, and even scriptural analysis. But what we do not differ on is the value of God's creation. I have never once been able to deny the life that he has lived his experience with the divine and the conclusions that he has arrived at, because if I were to deny any of that, I could no longer ask him to do the same for me. His experience, his journey, his life lived, his relationship with God is valid. Now, why do we struggle with this? Societally, I try to extend this even beyond just Christians. I have my own bias, and I have to own that bias, but I cannot deny that others have gone through different life events and experiences and come to different conclusions than me. So I have come to the conclusion that I'm going to rep my favorite player, okay, Jesus, or the God of Abraham, whatever you want to call him, and simultaneously not deny others' beliefs and faiths. This is something that is actually poorly received across most of Christendom. When I mention that I'm a pastor or a Christian, and then in the same breath, I advocate for Islam, Judaism, or Taoism, whatever it is, I do so with the understanding that all of those people of faith may be different faith, but they are still beloved children of God. Their experience is valid. And something that I hasten to add is that even within our own kingdom of Christ, we are wide and varied. So many Christians believe so many different things. How is baptism done? How is the Eucharist done? What defines marriage? How are we to act? What is moral? So many different experiences and relationships with one God. And yet I cannot find it in myself to fight with them on any of this. They are where they are because of their walk with the divine. And if anything else, at the end of the day, I choose to behave as Christ would have behaved, loving on them, giving them validity, choosing to encourage and sustain their walks, even when they look different from my own. And that's to me, that's because to me, everyone has a voice, a voice that is worth being heard. There are so many things that we have to learn in this life. And it's so much easier to learn and to grow if we listen. I have seen this make the rounds on social media in various forms, but I think that Henry Nouwen says it best. Listening is much more than allowing. Another to talk while we are waiting for a chance to respond. The beauty of listening is that those who are listened to start to feel accepted, start taking their words more seriously, and they discover their own true selves. Listening is a form of spiritual hospitality by which you invite strangers to become friends. If you don't know my dear Henry, he has degrees in psychology and theology. He participated in MLK's Civil Rights March in Selma. He is a prolific writer, a professor at Yale, Harvard Divinity, and Notre Dame across his tenure, and he is a Catholic priest. He was well-renowned not only for his compassion and grace, but for his inclusion. He had an ear for the voiceless. 
He advocated and encouraged new ways of thinking and being a person of faith. He wanted to make sure that we were never shorting ourselves of an idea or an experience just because someone saw it differently. And because of this, many of his writings were years, maybe even decades ahead of the rest of the Catholic Church. These writings still influence not only the Catholic Church, but many Protestant scholars and pastors. He wanted strangers to become friends. And by golly, that's something that I think Jesus wants too. He says, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That passage is is familiar to many of us. But advocating for treating the other with love and acceptance and encouragement and care often gets left out of our practice. We know it in our heads. But how well do we live that out? What if, and hear me out on this, what if there was no other? What if we treated everyone as if they had sacred worth, inherent to who they were as children of God? I mentioned at the beginning of today's message that things are only worth as much as someone is willing to pay for them. Well, friends, God was willing to pay everything for all of us. Jesus, as one of us, loved us enough to pay the ultimate price. There is no greater love than this than to lay one's life down for their friends. And Jesus was a friend, a friend to blue collars a friend to crooks, a friend to sex workers, a friend to the religious elites, a friend to violent criminals, a friend to you and me. If we are all worth the price that Jesus paid, isn't it time that we treated one another like it? So I'll leave you with this. You have value in the eyes of God. Your experience is real and valid. Your voice has worth and meaning in this world. And so does everyone else. They are loved by the heart of the divine. They were made with intentionality and care. And they are not the other. They are a part of we. And we are the children of God. Please join me in a time of silence as we reflect on maybe the words that we've heard, the music we've listened to, or the wisdom we will share the rest of the day. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite us now to sing one of my favorite hymns uh, chosen by Rob for us to sing today. This is my song. Here are my hopes, 
my dreams, my holy shrine. But other lands, in other lands, are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country's skies are bluer than the ocean, and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. What other lands have sunlight too and clover? And skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, O oh, God of all. A song of peace for their land and for like to invite us now into our time of prayer. And to begin, I simply uh, want to note um, the sobering um, number of people that uh, have contracted COVID-19 or have died from COVID-19 thus far in the United States. I feel like entering the month of May is a good time to just stop and to actually uh, let ourselves uh, experience uh, this loss and offer up prayers for those who have lost their lives or those who are still ill or recovering and for all the um, loved ones of those who have passed away. I was recently checking and the first COVID-19 case identified in the US was on January 21st. So we've had over three months of this. And in that time, we have lost 66,516 souls. You may have heard that this is more than all the Americans that died in the Vietnam War in just over three months. It is truly staggering. Sorry, that's just over, yes, three months, just over three months. And I want to invite you uh, now then and in, into just a moment of silence um, in observation of this marker as we enter the month of May. Let us pray together. Amen. As we continue our prayers this morning, uh, as before, we will do an interactive or a bidding prayer. I, after a, a brief uh, opening prayer, I will be inviting you to join with me in uh, petitions for uh, different groups of people that I will lift up. And after each uh, each uh, petition, I will say, God in your mercy, and I invite you to say with me, here are prayers. And 
I would invite you also to write prayer requests in the chat box on uh, Zoom or in the comments on Facebook Live. And I will try to uh, lift these up uh, verbally while we all lift up uh, prayers silently as well. Let us begin. Holy One, it is truly staggering the number of people that we have lost as a nation and as a world, as a global community. We have experienced nothing like this in our lifetimes, except for those of us who have been fortunate to live to a very old age. And we are wandering in the wilderness in uncharted territory, barely able to see ahead to the next week, much less the next month or the next year. God, we have at times felt leaderless, like sheep without a shepherd. And so we pray that you send us good shepherds and that those of us who profess the Christian faith will look to Jesus as our good shepherd in particular to guide us as we strive to walk with faith, hope, and love through these dark and challenging days. God, as we enter into yet another month living under the cloud of this pandemic, it is so good, so good to be reminded today by Reverend Rob of the tendency that we all have to make some people other to other them, to hold them apart from us, to pass judgment, to place them in a category for which we have less empathy, less compassion, less sense of solidarity. Whether that be because of factors relating to our geographical location, our nationality, our ethnicity, our religion, our gender, or our political views, it is so easy, so easy to paint others with a broad brush and stereotypes and fail to see them as people of sacred and holy worth, whose image, whose image that they bear from you cannot be erased. And so God help us to find in our hearts that capacity which only you can give us to love those we feel alienated from, angry at, even hateful towards. Those we may even have reason to believe are harming others by their actions or inactions. And yet we are called somehow to love them with your love, to see them through your eyes as broken yet beloved children of God. So we pray, oh God, today that you would help us to forgive, to forgive even as we hold them accountable for actions which remain harmful. Help us to strike this tender and difficult balance between demanding responsibility and offering olive branches of peace and reconciliation. Now, oh God, we, we come before you with the prayers of your people. We offer prayers of thanksgiving this morning for James, who ends up not needing surgery after all, for which we are very grateful, who can be treated with medicine and whose mother is cancer-free after successful surgery this week. We give you thanks that Pam's sister Susan, 
has been reunited with her life-giving medicine and her and her possessions and God willing will soon be traveling home from India. We give special thanks this morning for the life of Lesta Kneebone, long-term member of our congregation, much beloved soul and aunt of Dorothy Combs. And we pray that you would comfort Dorothy and Lesta's family, that you would also comfort Larry Long in the loss of his daughter, Kristen, Alhorn's wife's, Nancy's aunt, who was also lost to COVID-19 recently, as Larry's daughter was. For those whom we don't even know yet as a congregation uh, that have died in our extended uh, congregational family. God, we pray today for all those who have lost income and jobs in this time, for those who are struggling financially, uh, for those who don't know where their next paycheck will come from. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray today for loving prayers for all the differently abled adults and children and their families and caregivers who face special challenges in this time. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for Lindsay's son, Dave, and daughter-in-law, Rebecca, expecting twins, a high-risk pregnancy in these risk-filled times. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. God, we send prayers of love and joy to Anna Piparo as she celebrates her 99th birthday. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers for Skylar and the people who love him from Nan. God, in our mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for continued healing for Brent's niece, Elisa, Sister Gloria, and ex-sister-in-law, Kathy. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Herb, whose partner and family friend, Steve Booker, died last week, probably from effects of COVID-19. Give him light in the midst of grief. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for all those who are advocating for and working to see that immigrants are as human, as worthy of care and uh, compassionate and just treatment as we are, as essential members of our society, that our country will make policies that are humane and compassionate God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the Navajo Nation and the MMIW murdered and missing indigenous women, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we also pray for children, youth, and staff who are looking forward to camp at our UCC Camp Adams this summer and so many other camps and conference centers who are so disappointed. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We continue to lift prayers for all those around the world who have lost loved ones, those who are fighting COVID-19, those facing hunger and homelessness around the world. Let us be aware of the world's suffering and hold up that suffering to you, God, for healing we pray. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for frontline workers, especially healthcare providers, for government officials and public health officials, for nursing home staff in particular and all nursing home and senior living residents. God, in your mercy, Hear 
our prayers for hope, for peace, for calm in the midst of stress, and for those whose mental health and sense of well being has been affected by this lockdown. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now, oh God, we pray that you would hear the prayers of your people as we lift up to you our Lord's Prayer, saying together, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, once again, especially for those of you who have joined us since the opening of the service, I just want to welcome you all to this service of First Congregational United Church of Christ on the fourth Sunday in Easter. We are so delighted to have you here. And we are especially delighted today to welcome the Reverend Rob Tullock, who has been our guest preacher this morning. You may have noticed we've had a few extra visitors whose names you might not have known. We are hosting a neutral pulpit for Rob and a church in our conference uh, for their search process. And we will be doing this ourselves. Our own search committee will be seeking out a neutral pulpit or pulpits at some point uh, for a new settled pastor. And so we will welcome the hospitality of another congregation at that time. So it is wonderful to be able to pay it forward, so to speak. Well, I would like to um, invite everyone to connect with us. Uh, if you have not already, you may join our private Facebook group. Uh, you may get our weekly emails, which I highly encourage you to sign up for on our website, or simply let Andre Cordes or myself know that you wish to be added to our weekly email list. That contains everything you need to know to be part of this church especially in our online presence. Uh, Zoom links, Facebook links, uh, ways to engage not only on Sunday morning, but other ways throughout the week. Uh, when you get our weekly email, you'll learn about our new Thursday night offering for such a time as this, for the uh, prayer group that Reverend Avina is reading, uh, sorry, is leading, uh, called uh, Love Casts Out Fear. Uh, an opportunity to play Soulbox Bingo, godly play videos for your children, and so many other things. We are really doing our best to make sure that church goes on, that physical distancing does not have to mean separation from our community of faith. And so if you are missing people, if you are missing faces that you are not seeing showing up, uh, in our in our Zoom or Facebook settings, please reach out to them. I just discovered yesterday that James Haxby was not receiving weekly emails, didn't even know we were having services. So reach out to people if you see people that are not showing up and let's help them get connected. And Andre has been amazing, our communications coordinator, in helping people get connected. So He's willing to coach you. I'm willing to coach you. Kara, our business manager, is willing to coach you to connect with us online. So please stay part of our community until we can be together again in person. Please read the rest of our uh, weekly email. You can also find these weekly emails, by the way, on our website under Church News under the news and events tab. Uh, we post them every week if for some reason you don't want them in your email inbox. But you can read about ways to give to the hungry through our partnership with Clay Street Table and Home PDX Church and uh, a, a new way to serve our community by sewing face masks. So we are really trying to uh, be present to our community and be of help during this time. You can also read about how to support ballot measure 26210 
with the Here Together campaign, which will provide much needed services to our homeless neighbors. Finally, we invite you to join us today for our Zoom coffee hour. Just stay on Zoom if you're here or uh, uh, join us on Zoom. The link again is uh, in that weekly email that we send out. Uh, and if you are interested in our congregation's immigrant welcoming work, we will have a breakout session within our Zoom coffee hour for those who wanna meet together and talk about the possibility of endorsing and participating in the Oregon Home is Here campaign. As we think about ways to connect and participate in the life of our congregation, I simply remind you that uh, although we are not gathering together physically at this time, we still need uh, your, your sustaining gifts to us, uh, whatever financial gifts and pledges and offerings you are able to give us. We, need them at this time, and we invite you to continue to be generous. We, you have been generous, and I thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. There are multiple ways uh, to give online. Uh, you can give on our website. You can text us, or of course, you can, you can send in your contribution through the mail. So we give you great thanks for the ways you continue to support our church, and I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. Thank you, risen Christ, for moving the hearts of the people to give of themselves. May our offerings of service and financial support give voice to your work for justice and peace in this world. May we grow more mindful of you through our giving and our living. Amen. Friends, it's now time to uh, begin our service of Holy Communion. If you have not yet gotten your elements of uh, bread and juice or wine, whichever you choose to partake in, I invite you to gather those together at this moment. And uh, as I said before, when we had communion uh, together, we are in unusual circumstances. Um, we wish to feel and be join together in the true body of the risen Christ. And we cannot do that in our normal way by partaking of uh, the one loaf together and the one cup together in our uh, service of Holy Communion in person. And so, although we grieve our absence from one another in the flesh, we know that we are one body in Christ and that even celebrating the sacrament in our homes um, makes us more mindful of how we participate in the body of Christ together. Not even the coronavirus can keep us from our unity in Christ. And so today, while we don't have that common loaf to break together or beautiful communion ware on the altar, we have what we bring just as the disciples must have gathered together and, and made the, the unleavened bread for the Passover meal that Matthew, Mark, and Luke record, Jesus celebrating with his disciples as the Last Supper, we bring what we have to this table. Some of us have chosen to use uh, a one or two common recipes today and make matzah, unleavened bread, uh, such as the disciples might have eaten for the Passover meal. If you have made uh, your matzah, we are glad to join with you in that to feel even a little more connected. Uh, I must say that I cannot remember the last time I baked. So uh, this was uh, a wonderful treat to have this opportunity to make communion bread this morning. And so today, I invite you to lend. Christ and this church, your bread and your table. We remember that the Apostle Paul wrote letters to congregations throughout places we now call Greece and Turkey and Macedonia. They were the first remote worship communities, and yet they also uh, experienced unity through letters, that the technology of that time. And in one of those letters, the communion words that Paul sent 
to the church at Corinth were these. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had blessed it, giving thanks over it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Christ took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the glory of the Lord until he comes again. And now we do as followers of Christ have done for a thousand years. We take this bread made by human hands from the grain of the earth and this cup overflowing with the fruit of the vine. And we give thanks to God who blesses and nourishes us with the gift of God's creation. Come Holy Spirit, bless anew this bread and this fruit of the vine that it may become for us the living presence of Jesus Christ sustaining our journey and strength in all of our struggles. Even though we are all separated this morning, we join together to partake in this Eucharist. All are welcome at God's table. Let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. And let us in our many spaces receive the gift of God in this cup of blessing. We have a special solo, a mu special music for our communion time. And so I would invite Andre to share with us the video from our soloist, Joe Pettit. Come my way, my truth, my life. Oh, 
Now I invite everyone to join in our closing hymn, beautiful hymn of peace and hope. It is well with my soul. So I just wanted to say thank you to uh, all of you here at the church to filling in for this very weird neutral pulpit, uh, but it, it has been a joy to worship with you all this morning. So as we leave this morning, I extend to you a challenge. Go into your world as best you can while maintaining safe distances and honor the sacred worth in all of the people that you meet and live out the sacred worth 
within all of you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Rob. It is so good to be with all of you this morning. Go in peace. And those of you who wish to stay, feel free to stay for our Zoom coffee hour and for uh, our immigrant welcoming team meeting. It will uh, take a few moments to get that meeting going. Uh, but if anyone wants to step away and grab your coffee or your tea, uh, and come back. Uh, we'll be starting our coffee hour in just a few moments and our uh, immigrant welcoming team meeting for those of you who wish to join that. <laughs> ¶¶ 